what's going on welcome to cereal at midnight my name is heath and these are fresh flavors these are new arrivals essentially everything in this stack goes down past what the camera can see uh they're new releases they're things we haven't talked about here yet at cereal at midnight and they come from a variety of different labels distributors i'm really excited about talking about this stuff but before we go any further have you noticed that it's a new day it's cereal at midnight since the beginning of the year, we're rolling out all sorts of changes, improvements, tweaks. We've got new graphics, new music, new themes, new topic ideas, new furniture in the Serial at Midnight Studio. Very excited about where we're going with the channel, and it's a great jumping on point. So what we would love for you to do, we don't ask for likes and thumbs ups and things like that. What we would love you to do is just spread the word. Maybe we can even come up with a contest so we can give some stuff away to thank you for spreading the word. But just let people know that Serial at Midnight has entered a new level. We're doing different things. We've kicked it into a whole other gear onward and upward, and there's exciting changes happening. Uh, just let people know. Great time to jump on Serial at Midnight. Have a bowl of Serial at Midnight. So thank you for that, and uh, thanks for joining us for this conversation. I guess we'll just kick it off with... We're starting with Warner Brothers here, so... Before we go any further, I need to let you know that <clears throat> I was provided a free copy of this for review, but the opinions expressed are my own. So Scooby-Doo and Guess Who is the new, it's the newest Scooby-Doo show, okay? there's We got Scoob at the theater. This is the latest Scoob on the small screen, on the streaming screen. Uh, this is a, it's essentially a, weekly team up, you know, I say weekly, that's my roots showing my TV roots showing, um, in a time shifted world does we like weekly, I guess it doesn't matter. It's episodes episodic. So every single episode, a new, a new team up occurs with the Scooby-Doo, the, the mystery Inc gang and a guest star of that episode. Sometimes they're real people like, uh, Halsey or Ricky Gervais, which is one of my favorites so far. Cause he's like, you know, it's postmodern and it's, it, but it's, it's not really ironic in the sense that it's not taking the fun out of it. Right. It's not breaking it. It's just having fun with it. So Ricky Gervais is like, you just say your name, Scooby-Doo, you know, you're like Scooby-Dooby-Doo. they will be like me being like Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. That is that kind of like it, it acknowledges that we're in a cartoon, right? But it doesn't make fun of the fact that we're in a cartoon. It's very welcoming. It's fun. Uh, Christian Slater is in the series. Greetings and salutations. My name is Christian Slater. I am in an episode of Scooby Doo and guess who? Uh, there are imaginary characters that they team up with, like Sherlock Holmes, like. Uh, Batman, other superhero, Wonder Woman's in an episode. Um, some of the most fun for me are the Hanna-Barbera historical guest stars. And I don't even want to tell you all the people that are in this thing because... So, a big appeal of the show is, like, the mystery, ink of who's going to be the guest in the episode. So, I don't want to spoil anything for you guys. Well, there's 26 episodes. I've told you a few, right? So if you like the Funky Phantom, like if you're up on your Hanna-Barbera history, if you like Magilla Gorilla or Speed Buggy, you might like this show quite a bit. Um, it's very respectful to Hanna-Barbera history. And I love that. You know, some of, We know you guys love Hanna-Barbera too because some of our highest viewed videos are Hanna-Barbera related in nature. It's us covering cartoons like this. Uh, so... I, I love this. I absolutely love this show. Some, some of you have asked why, we, when I get these things in the mail, I like to uh, share 
photos, Instagram, social media. That's the first place you see some of this stuff. Uh, and then I like to spend time with them before I talk to you about them so that I'm not just like, well, this is Scooby-Doo and guess who? Uh, we have 26 episodes. I don't want, you don't want to do that. You want to spend the time. You got to do the work. So we always do the work here. Uh, but in the time between first sharing this with you guys and this video coverage, I've gotten questions from you guys who are like, you know, why no Blu-ray? Well, unfortunately, we have to acknowledge that we're living in a world where for many companies now, Warner Brothers, Disney, Paramount, uh, streaming is the biggest piece of the pie. That's where so much, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of hits, views, downloads, streams, disc sales, not those same numbers. And when it comes to physical media, DVD outsells Blu-ray about three to one. You know, these numbers change from week to week, but DVD almost always is three to one for Blu-ray. So, uh, and of course, 4K Ultra HD, which we love and which we support. It accounts for an average of about 6% of the market share of physical media sales. So we're probably going to be seeing more things like DVD only, DVD and digital, right? For Scooby-Doo, for things like this. I'm just grateful to have a disc, to have something that I can own and collect and put on the shelf with the other Scooby-Doo uh, TV shows and the movies. I love this stuff. And so if this is the form that ownership takes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're given the option. Let's move into some, so it's more TV on disc. We're talking about two Warner Brothers um, DC and uh, just Warner Brothers TV on Blu-ray. Let's, you know, let's, let's start with Doom Patrol. I don't know how to talk about Doom Patrol and do it justice. Uh, I'll try. It's from the mind of Grant Morrison, basically. Uh, he did not invent Doom Patrol. But he did put his stamp on it. Doom Patrol goes back to the Silver Age, uh, early early 60s stuff. But Grant Morrison is so closely associated with the Doom Patrol, his defining run, just like Alan Moore on Swamp Thing, uh, Frank Miller on Daredevil, right? There are certain creators that are so connected. But Frank, we're talking about Warner Brothers, so maybe Frank Miller on Batman Year One, that sort of a thing. Um, there are so, there are creators that are so, so so closely associated with a particular run or title. That's Grant Morrison. It's like I would have thought this was impossible to make into a TV show. Impossible, but they did it, and they did it twice. Because here's season two. Hopefully, there's a season three in the works. I know things are different with the the way that the the global like how we're filming thing. I know everything's changed right now, but hopefully, there's more Doom Patrol coming. But uh, wow, what a show, what a show. So smart, so psychedelic, so meta. Words fail, look with Grant Morrison, words do eventually fail. <laughs> it's like Jimmy Page meets um, Frank Miller maybe, you know, you've got this weird, I mean, it's so uh, on a whole other level. Uh, Brendan Fraser is my favorite from the show. He's so... You know, the redemption scene and the redemption of Brendan Fraser, because of course he was such a powerhouse in the box office all throughout the later 90s. I mean, even Encino Man, you know, like I go back to Encino Man with the cat and I just love the guy. But he's come back into his own, right? Like he went away, he's back, and he's doing some of the best work of his career in Doom Patrol. It's a great series. And here's the complete season two. There are some special features. Is that showing up for you guys? Uh, there's some special features there. It's not like hours and hours of special features, but I'm just grateful that they've included uh, what is there. Uh, and let's talk about Snowpiercer. Now, this is another one that's it's challenging to talk about. Snowpiercer uh, is based on the film by, I'm going to make sure I got the, Bong Joon Ho. Uh, was it eight years ago, maybe? Eight or nine years ago? Uh, Snowpiercer is a post-apocalyptic tale of a society that's basically living their existence on a train that is perpetually just going around in this massive loop. And in this train, there are different segments of society. So we're allowed to look at the, <clears throat> the caste system. We have within this show, within this premise of post-apocalyptic battles you know it's violence it's dark it's 
there's a lot here, but there's a lot of social commentary because we're looking at the divide between the haves and the have nots, the wealthy, the racially divided, the, the financially divided. Uh, there's so much tension in it. This series is so of its time, right? Because whatever Snowpiercer was commenting on all those years ago, we're only more of that thing now, right? So it's just really interesting. We've got Jennifer Connelly and David Diggs. Am I saying his name right? David, right? I know the guy from um, David. D yeah. So we'll make sure I'm saying that right. Uh, I know him from uh, Blackish. I think this is the first time I saw him was on Blackish. And uh, Hamilton. You guys heard of Hamilton? I. It's a musical, apparently. No, Hamilton is huge. And um, I think David is now like a. Uh, uh, a household name. So I have not finished this yet, so I'm not going to give you like a review or anything like that. Well, I'm sure we'll circle back around. You see what I did there? Uh, I'm sure we'll circle back around for a review later, but uh, it's, it's interesting and it's very topical and very timely. Now let's talk about something independent. We're going to talk about In Search of Darkness 2. I finally, I got my, I didn't finally, it's been here for a while, but I got my In Search of Darkness 2 uh, physical media release. It got the digital, you know, like a month, six weeks ago, maybe. Uh, part of my support was that I got the, the pressed copy of the first documentary as well. Um, not going to really review this because you know what it is. This is a documentary of talking heads of people that were associated with 80s horror movies. They cover a lot of ground between these two documentaries. Hours and hours, like eight hours between the two of them. Uh, I know there was some, oh, so you know what it is, right? Like it, if that's your thing, you're happy with it. If you don't like that, then you probably don't like this. So I don't need to review it. Um, but I know the last, those who backed in search of darkness one, there was, there were some issues behind the scenes with burned discs instead of pressed discs, folders that came folded, fo posters that came folded instead of rolled. Um, labels that were kind of warped. So I just wanted to show, here's my In Search of Darkness 1. We have, I mean, it looks it looks great. It's just as clean as, as it can be. This is a pressed disc, a a uh, factory manufacturer. You can't really see it, <laughs> but it is a factory pressed disc. Uh, that's one. Here is part two. I didn't go for any exclusive edition. I just went for the the bread and butter in search of darkness too. It's got a slip case, which is very nice. Um, it's got, it's knocking this stand over the stand. If you've seen past thrift store videos and things like I don't have a good experience with this stand. Uh, so here's part two again, incredibly well done. Another pressed, another pressed disc. You have reversible artwork, so you can choose whichever whichever cover you prefer. There's a flyer for In Search of Tomorrow, which I would love to see. I, you know, I, I, I don't know if there... I think this campaign has ended now, has it not? But uh, that's the science fiction one. That would probably be my jam. The, there's the In Search of Action Heroes, the last Action Heroes. That's the action movie one. Uh, In Search of Darkness. In Search of Tomorrow, that's my jam. Like Maybe more than anything. Science fiction movies may be my jam. Uh, so I'm going to have to look into that. But a lot of text here. Again, just really good quality production. And I, I'm only calling these things out because I've seen the questions. I've seen the, the angry tweets from people who complain about things. And I wanted to just show for posterity what we're talking about. Uh, here's my my pen. It came a little plastic baggy. It's good. Uh, here. Do I need to take this out? I don't know. You can see it, right? So there's my pen. And then my posters. This is the, the thing that I think... So there's three posters. Obviously, they're rolled. There's the second poster. And there's the third poster. So as far as the amounts of... Physical tangible benefits versus the investments that was required to fund this, fund this. Uh, I'm happy. And if these guys, if the team behind this uh, documentary reaches out to me again, if I get an opportunity to work with them again, it was a really good experience for me. Uh, the, the presentation, the communication, it was all a great experience. So I would love to work with these guys again. 
Um, moving on to Umbrella Entertainment out of Australia. Man, we got four releases here. Let's kick it off with Sky Sharks. This is crazy. Now, I have to say, this is an Australian release. Uh, this is region locked. For me, I, I had to I have a region free DVD player. I had to throw this into the region free DVD player to play this. It seems to be region four locked. Uh, but this is, <laughs> it is nuts. Um, maybe honestly, maybe too nuts for me, but I know you guys love this stuff and I, I got to tell you guys about it. So it's sky sharks. It is exactly, it is sharks. So we're dealing with like a, another post-apocalyptic kind of a future. Uh, we're talking about Nazis. We're talking about, um, experimental technology that allows sharks to fly as like airships. Um, we're talking about like genetic modification. We're talking about creating zombies out of dead people. It is insane. And the movie is so <laughs> relentless in its just drive. Um, it is meant to be Campy is not the right word. It knows what it is, right? It didn't just accidentally stumble upon this. This is not a movie for nuance of plot. It's not a movie for, you know, here's, it felt like I was, it felt like a video game. And for the video game generation, you know, if you spend eight hours a day playing video games, I suspect you're going to absolutely love this. Half music video, half video game carnage. Uh, and it seems to be like that's what these guys that make these, you know, it's a, a, the, the writer and the director are brothers from what I gather. And they, this is what they do, right? They excel at just making bonkers. Listen, this is filled with nudity. It's filled with extreme graphic violence. Tom Savini gets a nod in the credits, some sort of a consulting special effects guy. Um, just driving techno music and rock music to scenes of, of zombie carnage. I know you guys, I know so many of you guys will love this. Um, so again, I, I don't know. I don't even know how I feel about it. I just know that like, I was exhausted after I watched it. I was just like, holy cow, maybe what's a good comparison. Maybe like shoot them up. You guys ever see shoot them up with, uh, was it Clive Owen? Um, just like a dry, oh, Crank, that's another one, Jason, that's right, Jason Statham, I'm, I was in this movie called Crank, I just go, just non-stop, right, um, just like boom, 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 for 90 minutes, or this was actually like an hour 45, uh, 140, one hour and 43 minutes, so it's Sky Sharks, look, nuns, uh, Nazis, zombies, sharks that fly in the air, Curi I, I had to see this movie, and now I'm just like, wow, it's everything I thought it was going to be. Uh, and it, it's, it's relentless. That's what I'll say. It's relentless. Um, perhaps more my speed are the ones that we're going to talk about next, which is this classic Western. This is a, from the six shooter classics line. Uh, Umbrella has this entire line of six shooter classics, dozens of these movies. And they are Westerns. Some of these Westerns have pressings in other places, but a lot of the six shooter classics, they're only on disc through Umbrella. This is region free, or you know what? I'll say this. It played on my region one DVD player. I actually played this in my Blu-ray player, region A Blu-ray player, and it played fine. Um, it's Henry Fonda. It's Ann Baxter. It's Michael Parks. Uh, Michael Parks is the bag. I'm trying to find him here. Um, and here we go. Michael Parks. Uh, it's a TV movie from 1967 and it was it's directed by Don Siegel who hopefully you know from his 60s westerns and Dirty Harry okay so big influence on Clint Eastwood and it was the, the screenplay for this movie was co-written by one of the writers for Dirty Harry this takes place before Dirty Harry but it's that one-two punch of Don Siegel and one of the writers from Dirty Harry it's a very mature, smart, character-driven Western. So Henry Fonda comes into town. He's kind of like an alcoholic, kind of like a hobo. And over the course of the next like hour and a half, he evolves into who we know he actually is, who we discover that he actually is. This is a great character study. Uh, Michael Parks is the crooked sheriff of this town. 
Dan Derea is in this near the end of his life. I think he only had like two or three credits after this movie. Um, uh, who is it? Zalman King is in this B movie fans. If you like trip with teacher trip with the teacher, what's the, the, uh, exploitation movie where the biker guys just terrorize the field trip out in the middle of the desert. Zalman King, this is before that as well, but he's in this as, um, uh, as Zalman King, he kind of always did the same thing. So it's just really interesting to uh, to see this cast, this story. Uh, it's a very crucial time in in Western history. Uh, Henry Fonda, of course, like a year later, does Once Upon a Time in the West. Don Siegel goes and does Dirty Harry, and this so it's it's a really it's just a solid Western, and I'm so glad to have this now because I love westerns. I I see the requests for western spotlight volume two it's coming it's especially now that we're in that new era of serial at midnight uh stranger on the run is the name i didn't even say the name of it stranger on the run and it is so so good um by the way these so we're going to be talking about some uh basically imports for the next few minutes here um you can order these from Umbrella or from the companies themselves. There's also a lot of alternatives out there if you aren't in those countries. Uh, Diabolic DVD does a great job at stocking a lot of this stuff. Deep Discount does a great job at stocking a lot of this stuff. Look, and you can find it. And if you're looking on the Australian website and you're not Australian, remember, that's not U.S. currency. That's Australian currency. You got to do the conversion. I say this in a video because so many people are like, wait a minute. That's, is that dollar? No, that's Australian dollar. You got to do the conversion currency. The Fuller Brush Girl, a delightful comedy with Lucille Ball, pre-I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball, and uh, um, um, Eddie Albert from uh, Green Acres is the most obvious thing, but Eddie Albert was the man. Uh, favorite... Um, lesser known Eddie Albert performance in the gun runners with Audie Murphy. We talked about that one not too long ago. Uh, you will be surprised at how this man who seems so affable and good natured could be so threatening. Um, so this is, uh, it's actually a sequel, kind of a spiritual sequel to the fuller brush man, which had red skeleton in it. Red skeleton makes a, ca a cameo here. And uh, it's Lucy as a door-to-door -door fuller brush girl, which was like uh, maybe like an Avon, you know, if you're in the United States. I don't know. What are the, what are the contemporaries of Avon in other countries? Anyway, door-to-door -door cosmetics salesperson. And uh, she gets sucked into this murder plot, and it is just wacky. It's not intended to be taken seriously. It is high comedy. There's, at the end of the movie, there's talking birds that are voiced by Mel Blanc from like all the Looney Tunes voice, you know, like every, every Looney Tunes voice was Mel Blanc just about, but, uh, it is so much fun. And this, this is one of those discs like stranger on the run. They're not really around, you know, like these have been so obscure to find maybe some of these, this was, I think this was, uh, this is Columbia. At some point, there have been like burned on demand, manufactured on demand copies of some of this stuff. I don't even know that those are available anymore. So along comes Umbrella with pressed discs of this good stuff. I, we, the whole family watched The Fuller Brush Girl. Me, Bree, and Mini Midnight, we all gave it a thumbs up. Uh, last from Umbrella for this video is we're going to be talk, talking about the Eddie Duchin story. Uh, Eddie Duchin was a band leader, pianist, composer kind of a guy in the... 30s, 40s. This movie was made in 1956, and it's his life story. Um, and it's uh, it's it's Tyrone Power, it's Kim Novak, both of those. You know, Tyrone Power played Zorro in you know at one point in time when Bruce Wayne, when when Batman's parents were gunned down in Crime Alley, they had just left the Zorro film that uh, Tyrone Power was in. I don't know. <laughs> That's been changed over the years, but. When I was reading Batman, like Frank Miller's Batman, uh, this is the Tyrone Power of Zorro. Uh, there's, listen, I don't know what else to say about this. He, it's um, all through the war years. It's the story of this guy, kind of like uh, the Glenn Miller story, right? They they did several of these kinds of movies about the great band leaders of the time. It's a biopic, a biopic if you prefer, uh, but it's a it's a bio biographical picture of uh, Eddie Duchin, and it's very well acted. It's very it's great, and it's another one that is not easy to find. So the service of Umbrella 
to the movie going community is massive. We were so thankful for it. Uh, let's talk about imprint films and via vision entertainment imprint has arrived and it has done it again. You know, I love this label, this label, the imprint label walks the line between high class cinema, uh, movies that need proper Blu-ray presentations, like proper high definition, like preservation sort of a thing. And the physical media bells and whistles. They walk all three of the, there's like a crossroads and they do such a good job. I got to, I mean, I try not to talk about favorites, but I have to be honest with you guys. Imprint, via vision in general, it's like they have decided to take over the world by hard work and quality. <laughs> and so Imprint is just stunning. So let's talk about the movies themselves. We've got Dead Again, Kenneth Branagh, Emma Thompson, um, it's it's a one of the special features on this talks about how this is a movie that they don't it's the kind of movie they don't make anymore about the kind of movie that they didn't make when this was made so it's kenneth branagh basically making a memory loss thriller in the style of 40s noir memory like amnesia movies um and he's using you know black and white photography he's using it's actually shot in color, but they made it black and white to separate. So because people are like, but this flashback, is this happening now or is this a flashback? So they had to make the flashbacks black and white. But it plays with a lot of conventions. It is melodrama. Again, melodrama being like very heightened, very loud, not subtle. Um, but it's really good. And it's got a lot of great extras on here too. Oh, you guys can't see that. Uh, 1080p presentation, audio commentary. Uh, audio com another a second audio commentary with Kenneth Branagh, the man who directed Thor. Okay, he was um, uh, the professor in the second Harry Potter film. Um, but of course, before that, he was like a Shakespearean actor, and he came from the theater. And this was his second movie. And it's it's really interesting because it does feel like someone's second movie, but it's so ambitious. It's like, does he achieve everything that he's trying to achieve? I, maybe not. But wow. He shot for the moon, and he came close to hitting it. It's, these, This is what I'm saying. The imprint selections, the, the selections of titles that they choose are just, they're so good. They're the kinds of movies that we were talking about in the 90s. Now we just talk about Marvel movies, I guess, and we talk about big blockbusters. But once, this was, uh, this was everything back in the day. Uh, a Cut Above, Dead Again, and the Lost Art of the Hollywood Thriller, a visual essay by filmmaker, writer, and programmer Ian Mantgani. Man, Johnny, I'm not sure which one. I listened to, the, I, I watched this, but it's uh, it's excellent. Wonderful package. As with all imprint titles, uh, alternate artwork, the slipcase is limited to the first 1,500 units. After that, they go away. But it looks like with some of these, uh, we're getting the possibility to rebuy some of these. Nevertheless, don't snooze. If you're interested, um, track them down on either ViaVision's website, JB Hi-Fi, and again, Diabol Diabolic DVD, um, deep discount. There's a lot of places you can get these. Convert to your currency. Can't say it enough. Year of the Dragon. Mickey Rourke. Uh, kind of a 80s take on Chinatown. Um, not to compare because you don't compare something to Chinatown. But it is a crime drama that's set in Chinatown. Mickey Rourke is great. He's intense. He's it's, I mean, he's Mickey Rourke, right? So I don't even know what else to say about his performance. He's very, he takes this stuff seriously. You know, he's very invested in his craft. Um, two audio commentaries from heaven to Chinatown, David Mansfield on Michael Tomino's uh, interview. Okay, I'm botching this. It's loaded with extras. Okay, I'll hold this up and you guys, hopefully you guys can see that. Sometimes with the lights, depending on the color of the text, it can be very difficult to see. As with all imprint titles, Year of the film on the spine, they're numbered. I love this label. At close range. I had never seen this movie before. I'd heard of it, but I'd never seen it. It's Sean Penn and Christopher Walken. And, and Sean Penn, it's it's 1986. Yeah, 1986. Sean Penn's like in his 20s, but he looks like he's 18 years old. He looks so young in this movie. Also, young Crispin Glover, one year after Back to the Future. Young Kiefer Sutherland. I don't even know if Kiefer has any lines, but these are, I mean, they look like babies, but, uh, Sean Penn is basically Christopher Walken is a, this is based on a true story. Uh, there was like a crime 
gang in, I think they were in Pennsylvania and they would like steal tractors and sell tractors. They had like this very intricate crime um, method worked out. And Sean Penn is the son who kind of gets caught up in it and it's walking at his absolute best because he's not yet, I mean, it's post deer hunter, but he's not yet the walking of like the, the postmodern pop uh, of uh, Christopher Walken, the, the Pulp Fiction, and you know, the guy who would do this. But he's still Christopher Walken, and he's still, he's really, really, really good. He's dangerous, he's wild. And he's young enough that he still has that virility where he feels physically imposing as well. Uh, highly recommended. This is one of my favorite discoveries of this batch of imprints because I hadn't seen it before. It's really good. Um, fire in the sky. Oh my goodness. Why am I laughing? I asked you guys on uh, Instagram. I was like, which one? When these came in, I was like, you guys, the new imprints here. Love imprint. Which one of these should I watch first? 201. I think just maybe then maybe there were a couple, but almost everybody said fire in the sky messed me up and it did like it messed me up too. This movie is terrifying. It's about an alien abduction. It's an account. It's based on a book. It's the account of a man and his abduction experience. And I mean, it's horrifying. It's a horror show. And everyone who sees this movie is like, oh, geez. Everyone who sees this movie is like, oh, man. Oh, that movie messed me up so bad. It's it's intense, man. So this is actually, I saved this one for last. I watched everything else first. Uh, but Fire in the Sky, this is, I have this on DVD. Um, it's been out of print for a long time. It's an expensive DVD, so thank goodness to imprint to via vision for putting this on a blu-ray because it really really needed one this is what i'm talking about the uh the service to the film community with getting these movies that you know some companies release the same movies like five times other companies are digging deep and they're like what is the need in the market and then they serve that need and that's what imprint's doing uh there's the special features i won't even try to read all of those to you but wonderful stuff uh, I believe Ballyhoo was involved. Daniel Griffith, our, our, the, we love Daniel Griffith. We love Ballyhoo. Um, I believe he had some involvement with some of those special features as well. My other favorite discovery from this wave of imprint titles is Rage. Glenn Ford, Stella Stevens. This is essentially a 60s... It's a, it's a Western that takes place in contemporary times. So trucks, uh, miners, you know... Um, you know, it, just, it takes place in the 60s, in the mid-60s. Was this 1966? Never seen this movie. I don't even know if I'd heard of this movie before. This is one of those that's just way off the radar. Glenn Ford is uh, an alcoholic doctor working in a town in Mexico. This is a Mexican production. It was filmed in Mexico by a lot of Mexican crew. Um, Glenn Ford is uh, just out in the middle of nowhere, basically. And Stella Stevens... A three-time playmate, Playboy Playmate, if I remember correctly. There's a great video essay on here by Kat Ellinger. Um, about 25 minutes talking about the career of Stella Stevens. She was in Girls, Girls, Girls with Elvis Presley. She was in, oh, I mean, so many. The Courtship of Eddie's Father. Um, she's a prostitute. Comes into town on a truck full of other prostitutes. She sticks around. And... It sounds like it's going to be like a character piece of like, you know, alcoholic and a prostitute with a heart of gold. And they find it like leaving Las Vegas or something like that, but it's not. Um, it's about rabies, <laughs> right? Like this is like, wait, what? Uh, Glenn Ford gets rabies from a dog bite and they get stranded in the desert. And the movie is stranded in the desert with a man with rabies trying to get to civilization. And it is excellent. It is excellent. So that's at close range and uh, rage are my two favorites from the entire wave. Of course, we get also the deep. This is the last of the six that were released at the same time. The, the deep. Um, it's written by Peter Benchley after Jaws. It stars Robert Shaw after Jaws. It's about um, trouble in the ocean. 
after Jaws. There's so many, so much of this feels like um, an attempt to well, let's do that again, but without the shark. You know, let's do this in a different way. Uh, it's Nick Nolte. It's Jacqueline Bissett. And <sighs> I, do I say I think this movie launched a lot of people into puberty, honestly, because Jacqueline Bissett spent so much of the the movie's running time in either white dresses uh, or in a white wet t-shirt. Like, I mean, it's a PG movie, right? This is a PG. Um, but that's what people, I mean, it's very, people remember that. It had a very lasting impression on a, on a whole audience, that, that Jaws audience that goes to see what happens again. The treasure hunters under the water, there's trouble under the water. We got to get Robert Shaw. He might know what's going on and he can help. Uh, it's a good movie. It's just, um, it's, it's interesting how much the success of Jaws seems to have played a part in just even the very existence of the deep. So I don't know. It's really cool to have this because this has a Blu-ray elsewhere that I have. And I think they look about the same. Uh, I have not compared the special features to see which, like what all is carried over, but I will say this is loaded and it's a beautiful presentation of a very interesting, visually uh, arresting movie. So that's going to do it for the imprint titles. But we're not done with Via Vision because we're also going to be talking about the Randolph Scott collection. I mean, we're at like 40 minutes. I got I to gotta move this thing along. Uh, this is eight Randolph Scott movies. These play perfectly fine on my... Re I should say all these things... The, uh, the imprint titles, this, uh, they play on my Region A player. Uh, this contains the following Randolph Scott Westerns. Of course, we just passed Randolph Scott's birthday. Uh, I think it was 1898 he was born. Love Randolph Scott. It's been so many, not just Westerns, but also, uh, you know, he was in like comedies and dramas. Like he was a great actor. Love Randolph Scott. Some of these have been on uh, other presentations from other companies, but a lot of these are making a disc debut on this collection. So again, the people that are b behind these, you know, these companies are finding a need in the market. They're saying, okay, this doesn't have a DVD presentation. Let's do this. They're finding these gaps, these movies that need home media presentations and they're putting them out. The Alan Ladd Collection Volume 1. Now, this is not new for release, but it's new for me. This came out in 2020. We talked about Volume 2, but I got my hands on Volume 1. So, Volume 2 has four... They're not obscure, but again, they're movies that needed discs that just didn't have disc representation. Uh, volume 1 has five films on it, and they're great. I mean... The, the, I remember talking to my friend Patrick Bromley from F This Movie. We were talking about old movies, and he was like, do you feel like if you watch an old movie, you just assume automatically it's going to be good? And I was like, I do. And he was like, why is that? And I said, I think it's because they were always good. There was this a competency to studio movies of the 30s, 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, that you knew... The acting was going to be good. The script was going to be good. The direction was going to be good. It was going to not necessarily be three hours long. It was going to use its time well. Alan Ladd uh, associated with a lot of Westerns, Shane, right? But was in a lot of very classic noir films as well. So he was a very versatile actor. I kind of always associated him with um, more, not necessarily country roles, but kind of salt of the earth roles like this. I'm just kind of a good man out in the desert. But then you see him in these noir films and he's not like that at all. He's like, yeah, see, well, what are we going to do? You going to go over there? Oh, you go over there. There's going to be trouble. See, you don't want to go over there. So, so how much of these choices were in the, the decisions that were made behind the portrayal? It's, it's really fascinating. Um, Ransom, the complete series. This is a U.S. Well, actually, Ransom was... A collaboration between like many companies and and uh, is there a list on here of who all's involved with this? Uh, if if my memory serves, this was a co-production between several television networks like French television, Canadian, U.S., uh, maybe even Australia is in the mix on that. But Ransom was a TV series that ran for three seasons, and this is all three seasons in one. Um, 
112 disc set. So again, ViaVision continues to do like uh, Future Man and Shades of Grey and Timeless TV series that played everywhere but then didn't get a disc release. So ViaVision's like, guess what? There's that gap in the market. There's where we need it. Let's put it out on disc. And I love them for that. Um, this is the... There have been many interpretations of this character. Uh, a detective from... See, I'm, you notice I'm not even attempting to say the name because I don't want to make anybody mad. But it's Albert... Not Albert. It's uh, Michael Gambon from... Um, <laughs> it's Harry Potter, right? He's the Dumbledore from Harry Potter. But uh, Michael Gambon is a great actor. He goes back to the 70s? I don't know if I've seen him before the 70s. But... Uh, these are very, I have not watched all of these yet, but this was a detective series, like an investigation series. It's on four discs. It is, um, it's like, um, there should, you know, I was gonna, there's no, I don't see how many, epi oh, 12 episodes. Okay. So there's 12 episodes. First episode is like the pilot. It's like the 90 minute pilot. Then they're like 50 minutes after that, but they're very, they're smart little mysteries. So, I mean, it's a British show, right? It's a UK created show um for itv if i remember correctly and it's uh early 90s i think isn't there a version of this with um i'm in uncharted territory now i should i probably shouldn't say this i feel like they've done this series again with rowan atkinson mr bean as the detective uh but there's such a charm about this sort of thing for me i love these I just love British TV in general. I feel like it's smart, it's um, more patient, and they don't run concepts into the ground. When something's run its course, they're just done. They move on. So with this show, 12 episodes, two seasons, two series, and you're done. Uh, this brings us to a very similar show, The Last Detective. By the way, I have to say to you guys, uh, the, everything we're going to talk about, from we have four more, one, two, three. And then there's two more here on the table. These are going to be region locked to uh, region four, probably not region one friendly. But you got a region free player, right? You're you guys are region free, hopefully. Um, the last detective, it's uh, Sean Hughes and Peter Davison, Doctor Who number five, David Tennant's father-in-law, right? Um, again, he's the premise behind this show. It's another one of those investigative shows. Is that He's the last person you would expect to be the detective to solve the case. He's the last person to get the assignments. He's the last detective, right? Uh, and out of that comes a lot of fun. Again, I haven't watched the entire series yet, but I can say uh, it's that thing again, that intelligence, weekly, I, mean, I don't know if they were weekly or not, but that episodic mystery, crime solving with a very British sense of style and even the winking sense of humor just that uh british british sense of whimsy maybe it is i, I don't know how to explain it um hey, let's do this for both of these who has watched these shows what do you guys think about them who loves mysteries this, here's what i want to know in the stuff that we cover who's into the british mysteries like we talk about benny hill we talk about kenny everett show also from via vision uh, British mysteries are a very different thing. Who out there is into this stuff? Because I am, and I want to know who else is. Do I have an audience that's interested in smart, intelligent mysteries? Uh, Return to Eden. <laughs> this is a... Is it infamous? I mean, it's wild. It's the story... So it was a three-episode a three episode miniseries in Australia. And it's this, this woman is like, she's not so attractive. She's in a crocodile attack. There's like reconstructive surgery. And after the surgery, she's beautiful. And she becomes like a high society modeling, well-to-do person. Gets mixed up with this tennis professional. Uh, but it's the infidelity and it's the backstabbing. And it's, it's so... Oh, it's so... Is it camp? Is it cheesy? I don't know. It's I, I say it's it's... It's Miami Vice meets Dallas meets Dynasty. It's everything we love about wild 80s TV. And because the miniseries was so successful, they came back with like a full series, a TV series that ran for, I think it was just one season. Uh, 
So this is the collection of the mini series and yeah, the 22 part spinoff series here for the first time is the ultimate complete saga, including the revised last episode, which ties the loose ends together when the series failed to return for a subsequent season. So, uh, 1983 to 1986 is the time frame that this takes place in. I mean, people who have seen this, I, <laughs> here we go. It's a crocodile. Oh man. It is bonkers in the best way possible. Like I haven't finished the 22 episode series, but, um, I just love this stuff. Maybe there'll be an opportunity to circle back around in future review paloozas because we still do those. It's just been a while. We've had so many new releases lately. Uh, we'll circle back around in a review palooza and I can tell you what I think about the, the 22 episode series that followed the mini series. Uh, Bless This House. This is where we're going to end this video. This is the complete series of Bless This House. Another British TV mainstay, I'm going to say. Bless This House is one of those... How many years did this go? I want to say six years, maybe? Uh, yeah, it is series one through six. And there was a movie, All This and Christmas 2, the Sid James television special, and the 1972 feature film spinoff is also included in this package. So Sidney James is in the Carry On films, you're not going to find a lot of Americans talking about the Carry On movies, but they are, uh, I like them. I have the entire series. I also have the Carry On TV series. Uh, they are wacky British comedies with a, they're cheeky, right? They're a little naughty, but not in a mean way. They're the, the kind of the movie equivalent of Benny Hill. Uh, so the, the, the lead actor, um, um, Sid James comes from the Carry On franchise, and it is essentially for American audiences who may not. <laughs> there he goes again. For American audiences who may not be familiar with this, it is uh, kind of like All in the Family. He's the the you know he's lived his life a certain way, and he's very buttoned down and very straight. And then of course his his kids are into the hippie movement, and like his daughter's on the pill, or is she on the pill? And so, of course, it's like the man out of his time, right? But, but you know, the world as I know it has been this. And now there's people wearing, men are wearing jewelry and my daughter's on the pill and she's going out on dates and that kind of a thing, right? And so there's a lot of mileage out of that. But it's really good. It's that British sense of humor. Uh, first few episodes are in black and white. Then they transition to color. It's great. I haven't watched the whole thing. Again, I want to be honest with you guys. I haven't watched the whole thing, but I have watched some of it, and I really like it. Uh, these are classics, and they're classics for a reason. Um, I don't know that Bless This House ever aired in the United States. Maybe on public broadcast, like maybe PBS back in the day. Can you guys speak to that? Can anybody let me know if these have had... Uh, uh, U.S. broadcast at any point? If not, I'm recommending this because it's... You know, we always love access. That's the, the the reason we do these videos. That's why we collect physical media in the first place is we want access to pop culture history, to film and television history. This is a big chunk of British television history. So uh, kudos to ViaVision preserving this and for uh, sending it to this American to talk about on his YouTube channel. Because we have audience, you know, we're all over the world as far as our audience. So uh, we, you know, it, but let's do this. If you guys like this show, if you're going to pick this show up, let me know in the comments below. I just want to get some feedback from this stuff. I like to know who's watching, where you're watching, what's your experiences with some of this stuff. We're, again, we have viewers everywhere. So just let me know if you appreciate this kind of coverage. Uh, it, it'd be nice to get some feedback on that. But that's, listen, that's the stack. That's, we did it. That's the new release stack for this Fresh Flavors video, the first ever Fresh Flavors branded video. Guys, thank you much, so much for hanging out with me, talking about all these new releases. Let me know what you're interested in. Let me know what you're going to buy, what you think about the things we talked about in this video. Continue the conversation. I just love to continue talking about this stuff in the comments below. Uh, so thanks so much. Take care. And until next time, I will catch you later.